So we really have a broad uh, group of folks here, right? Some people who have tested, who have interviewed, who have are currently working or have you know worked in, in some version of um, civil service, meaning government work. Um, I am a DPH employee, but I am not representing DPH tonight. I'm representing myself. Um, I'm freestyling over here, so any um, concerns that you have, um, you know, we can talk after the the training, and I can answer any questions. Just kind of as a civilian who were who went through the process, I'm sort of also self taught, so I feel like reflecting that back to you. Um, I developed this training on my own because it's a lot of questions that people have, and um, I feel like it's important for everyone to have access to this information, both internally to my department, but also um, for folks who are interested in general. Um, so this may change and this may, you know, uh, be a, an iteration of a different type of training as it emerges and as I learn more, um, but just wanted to share that I'm sort of here as a volunteer, here as a, a support to my fellow San Franciscans, um, and I also have been through this process. Um, so that's kind of where this content comes from. Um, what to expect tonight? Um, it's going to be a lot of definitions, a lot of descriptions, most of which will not make a lot of sense to you if you are, if you're brand new. So some of this might connect to, you know, if you've interviewed for a city job or if you've tested it, it'll make more sense because you might have seen it before in some version. If you're brand new, I will try to make it as entertaining as possible, acknowledging that there's a lot of definitions and a lot of just sort of um, uh, descriptions of things that may or may not make a ton of sense. So pop up a hand. If it's a super specific question, I'll take it after the training um, if it's specific to your experience. But if it's a question that, you know, is about a word you don't understand or something that it's not clear, please pop up a hand and I'll, I'll answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will share the slides. Thank you for asking. Um, I passed around, or Danya helped me pass around a sign-in sheet. Um, and so I will send, if I can read your handwriting, I will send you the slides after the presentation. There are some links to websites here that'll be useful and, and, and some other training materials. So absolutely access these if, um, if that's something you, you want to do afterwards. Thank you for asking. Any other questions before we start? No? OK, great. So you know a lot of definitions. We're going to give some tips and resources on test prep. Um, in addition to being a civilian human, I also come out of higher ed. So I am a former educator, a former teacher um, with adults. And so a lot of the tips for test prep are also coming from that. I used to teach high stakes testing and standardized testing as part of my background in GED, adult basic ed, ESL, English second language. Um, so some of this is, you know, city specific test stuff, but a lot of it's just like people specific test stuff. So it's a little bit um, interwoven. And again, questions as they come, please raise a hand. And if I can take them, if I need to take them after, I will. Um, and we'll move through. Uh, we did this. And who's in the room? So I'm going to be referring to websites. And again, these will be linked in the slides. We won't um, need to pull them up right now. Um, but I'll be referring to the SFDHR job site as well as the exam information website. This is um, tiny print, hard to read, a little bit confusing. But the second website that's listed here is essentially a general idea of when our tests will occur throughout the fiscal year for most of our classifications. Um, Less common classifications or more niche or specific classifications won't be listed there. Neither will temporary positions, which I will talk about in just a second. But for the permanent civil service exams, there will be a schedule that you can access here by fiscal year. And you can look up our most common classifications, meaning our most common jobs. And you can get an idea roughly of when we'll be announcing those positions and when we might be testing for them. So I'll refer to these websites, and you can pull them up after. Um, so just a very quick overview, and I feel like this is the most important diagram that I need to carry around in my pocket. Um, for those of you who worked in federal government or international like di diplomatic service, there's the foreign service exam. And I think I heard one person has, has taken that. That's a very specific exam, extremely high stakes, extremely hard to pass. Um, counties, states, and cities have their own version of that that is also high stakes, also a little bit difficult to pass and navigate. But basically, you don't get to take that test, the civil service exam, until you've applied for a job. Um, I didn't know any of this when I was navigating my own hiring process, so I actually applied for a job and got a job 
and took the job, not realizing that it wasn't a civil service job, it was a temp job, and I was surprised, and it was news to me, and I had to figure that out, right? So I was like, what test? You know, everyone was like, oh, you passed the test, right? And I didn't, because I didn't actually have the job I thought I had. So all of that to say, it seems counterintuitive to break this down, but you have to first see when the jobs are announced, apply to the job in the right window of time, uh, test for that position if you get past the initial application, and then you will be invited to interview. So I've heard, you know, some folks have interviewed, some folks have tested. It's a little bit everywhere. Yes. The jobs are announced on the actual job site when they're open, but before they're open, you can get an idea within about a quarter, uh, a fiscal year quarter, of when that job will be announced. Um, and I'll pull this up at the end if you if you want to put eyes on it. Um, the actual job site and the job announcements, um, if that'll be helpful. Um, moving through. Um, and actually, hold on. Do I have this slide up here? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll toggle back to the other slides in just a second. But to if you have questions specifically about the application process, there's a whole other workshop that's so fun and so entertaining, and I think you should come. It's next month, February 13th, and it'll be uh, in the downstairs Hispanic Latino room. But that's a much more in-depth uh, look at how to apply, how to fill out your application, how to make it sizzle, how to get through kind of that initial um, gate, which is the application process, so that you can come and take a really fun high-stakes test after. So this is kind of the test uh, talk. And then next month will be the initial application talk. So if you have specific questions about applying, um, let's talk afterwards or come to my talk next month. Um, just wanted to put a plug in for that, that today we're just going to talk about testing. Um, temporary positions with the city mean no test. So great news, you don't have to sit for a really stressful test. Bad news, it's a temp job, right? Uh, which means you can be, you know, let go when the job is, is done or the grant dries up or the person on leave comes back from leave. Um, and it also isn't necessarily a foot in the door. So that's something that we talk much more in depth on in February. So a temp job with the city is great for experience and exposure but it's not a traditional temp job where they're going to love you and hire you. There's still going to be a process where you have to be on a list and show up for the test, et cetera. And I'll talk much more about that in Feb if you come to my other training. Yes. Uh, if it's permanent civil service, there will be some sort of test, and I'm going to define what all of these tests look like. Some of them do not feel like standardized tests, and so we'll go through what they are. So you may not sit for an exam, but there may be some sort of screening that would be considered your test. Um, so in some way, shape, or form, and we'll look at the different versions of that, you will have to take a test, even if it doesn't look or feel like a standardized test might look or feel normally. Um, but again, sort of the, the job search piece is when you apply initially and then you, you, ex you take the exam. And again, if you want more information, um, definitely come to my talk in February. But as you're looking on the job site, for those of you who are brand new to civil service, definitely start there. There is too much information. It's a little bit confusing. But if you start to look and if you're drinking something fabulous that takes the edge off, I highly recommend it, whatever that is for you, OK? Um, it, it takes time. It's a little bit confusing to navigate initially, but get comfortable with that job site just as a start, kind of your homework for tonight if you're brand new to this. Look around at the jobs, click on the job descriptions, put on your reading glasses because the font is very small, right? Um, but start exploring what types of jobs are out there in civil service um, just to kind of get comfortable and then come in February, we'll talk more about applying. Um, you can also put in notifications if you see a job you like but you're not quite ready to apply to it, or maybe you missed the deadline, you can always put in a notification for that job on the job site. And again, at the end, I'll pull up this website for those who want to stick around, and I'll show you how to navigate it. Um, but if you do have kind of a dream job, um, for example, the job I have, which is as a trainer, um, I really don't qualify for a lot of city jobs. I'm an educator. I like worked in adult basic ed, so there's not, I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. There's not a lot of stuff that's a natural fit for me. Um, but I do love training, facilitation, working with people. So for me, really the only job is this 1232 classification that I hold, the training officer. Um, and those jobs don't open that often. So I put in a notification saying, well, maybe in a year I want to make a job change, right? And that's initially how I got notified of the opening for the position that I have now. 
Um, so, so I tell people this at my other training and I'll tell you now, a city job is not a job that you're going to get like in a month. It's not a job. If you need a job right now, it's not going to, it's not going to do it for you. Um, if you need a job in like a year and a half, let's talk, right? Cause it takes a while. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about that at my other uh, conversation in Feb. Um, so talking about exams, right? You've already applied to your dream job. You found it, you waited, you applied. They got through the initial screening. And uh, the types of exams that you'll sit for are for permanent civil service positions. Um, there's these acronyms on the job site, which again, we'll pull up in, at the end. But if you see CBT, CCT, or PBT, these essentially mean these are permanent civil service jobs. They have exams as part of the requirement to get through, which means they are permanent, right? And a permanent civil service position is like sort of that cliched example of all the Sacramento folks who retired at 55 and are traveling now incessantly. That's like, that's the good job that you keep forever and, and there's great benefits and you get to have a pension and all that stuff that exists only in fairy tales outside of government, right? So these are the jobs that you want if that's the type of career you're looking for, like a long-term, sort of benefited position with the city or county. Uh, permanent civil service is what you want. TEX, PEX, TPV, I heard, you know, temp, provisional, a couple of different types of jobs. These are temp, right? They're not permanent. Um, it's not to say they're bad jobs. It's not to say you don't do interesting work while doing those jobs, but it is not the permanent civil service that you may be thinking of when you apply to a city job. Um, so again, lots more on that when we have our next meeting in February. Yes. It's the million dollar question, and the answer is no. Well, the answer, the answer is like this many people get to do that, and it's really, really rare. Um, very recently, we just did a big conversion of one uh, type of classification, the 2903. No, excuse me. I can't, remember, I can't remember, but there was some big batch of temporary folks that were hired that were just converted to permanent, but that like only happens like every 11 years, right? Sort of like an eclipse. Um, so I wouldn't bank on it. But if you are temporary, it means that you're, you're in the game, you get to know people, you might hear that a test is coming up that you might test for or that a position might be opening, um, but it's all also publicly aware. It's, it's publicly advertised as well. So you don't necessarily have an edge, but it, it doesn't hurt if you're just curious to get into government. Yes? Uh, this is class-based test. So the classification dictates the type of test, meaning if it's a muni driver class, you would have to probably drive a bus for your test, right? That, so the, the classification means the job type. Um, the class-based test is CBT. CCT, um, I'm trying to remember the acronym and I can't remember it, but it's on the website. You can just search on the job site for it. And PBT is position-based test. So um, we hire a lot of muni drivers, we hire a lot of clerks, we hire a lot of different types of classifications, sometimes hundreds at a time. Uh, we only hire my classification, maybe four or five people a year maybe less. So my test was a PBT, a position-based test, which means that for this very unique niche position, we will create a, a specific test for that rather than a broad classification test where maybe 400 people sit for it. Um, and, and you mentioned that in the back about you know maybe 400 people getting through the 2903. So it really depends on the job. Um, there are clerks in the fire department, there are clerks in the police department, there are clerks at public health, there are clerks in vital records, there are clerks in the controllers, right? So a clerk is a very broad classification. We might uh, test, you know, 700 people, hire 300 of them, and disperse them throughout the city like, like leaves on a windy day, right? The leaves we love and who are very important and valuable, right? Um, but the position-based tests are for jobs that are a little bit less common. Um, and so there might be a specific test that's catered just to that role that maybe we test five people on, 20 people on, 30 people on, right? So that's the acronym for the permanent. And these are all on the job site if you wanna fact check me, which I highly recommend doing. Um, how do you know if you need to take a test? Well, if you look on the job site, you pull up your dream job and it's with the fire department or with the public defender's office or whoever, and it'll say down here, job type, CBT discrete. It doesn't make any sense. It's not, it's not user friendly, okay? But because I just gave you this golden nugget, CBT, that means it's going to be permanent. And discrete, I think, means something about how long the list lasts. Again, all of this is on the website. Um, I would not fill your brain with that information, but the most important thing is this acronym is gonna be the permanent job, right? 
if it says TEX or TPV or PEX, you'll know that it's temp. Doesn't mean it's a bad job, doesn't mean it wouldn't be a cool experience, but it's not gonna be a permanent job, right? And the good news is that you won't have to take a test if it's temporary. But if it's CBT, CCT, or PBT, uh, you will sit for some sort of exam and that exam will look uh, like different things that we're gonna dive into right now. Um, again, temporary is going to be uh, exempt from civil service, so not permanent. Um, you'll also get some really good information on the job announcement, even though the font is tiny. And by the time you've had a special beverage and looked at all the jobs, you want you might not be in the best uh, place to be reading. Um, but if you scroll all the way down to the very bottom of the job announcement, there's something called selection procedures. Um, again, not user-friendly language, but what that really means is they're telling you what type of, of, of exam you'll have and what weight it will hold on your rank, right? You're, you're going to be scored and ranked. So for this job, I think it's a health program coordinator three that I pulled. There's a written exam, and the weight says 100%. So that means, okay, the pressure's on. 100% of how you rank will be based on how you do that day on a written, like, fill-in-the-blank bubble test, right? No pressure, right? But at least you know, and you can do some things to prepare, and we'll show you some tips on how to prepare in just a second. So there may, it may say weight 50% written, 50% oral. That means you'll probably sit for a written test, which will be stressful, and then you'll get to go sit for an even more stressful written uh, uh, exam, or excuse me, oral exam, where maybe you'll have to interview, or in my case, I did a presentation. Um, so there might be two components to your test, right? Um, and that tells you the weight based uh, on what the selection procedures tell you. Um, and the good news is there's also preparation tips here, right? Under selection procedures, if you read the fine print, which you can't see here, um, it will actually outline more or less the types of skills and knowledge that they're looking for on this test. So it says they're looking for someone with the ability to establish and maintain effective and cooperative relationships, interpersonal relationships, ability to interview people, exercise good judgment, right? It doesn't tell you what's going to be on the test, but you can kind of read between the lines to say, okay, there's going to be a lot of questions about people management on this exam, or there's going to be a lot of questions about uh, conflict, right? Probably scenarios where you have to navigate conflict on this test. Um, or it might just say something like, you're applying to be a gardener, you're going to have to show us how to successfully transplant a tree, right? It'll tell you in selection procedures based on the job you're applying for. So that's a real sort of gold mine of information that's way, way at the bottom of the job description. Um, yeah, kind of helpful. Tells you just in general what to look for and what might show up on the test. Um, there is a multiple choice test prep manual on the website. It is very generic. So if you're hoping to get like inside scoop on what might be on your test, you're wrong. But that's okay. It doesn't mean you shouldn't look at it. Um, and I'll tell you exactly why that's helpful in just a little bit. Um, so selection procedures, lots of good details there if you keep scrolling to the bottom of the job you're looking for. Um, so we have these different types of exams. Um, I said that some of them will feel like a seated exam, high pressure, fill in the blank, you know, using a, a pencil that they issue you. And some of them might not feel like an exam at all. Okay, so we're going to go through the types of exams that the civil service currently uses as, the, as a gate to let people in or to keep people out of positions. So we'll start with a written exam, sort of the classic like 1980s, 90s high school exam where there's like four options and you're like, oh, there's two that are good and two that are bad and I'm going to roll a dice, right? <laughs> and then you think of all the tips that you learned in your prep class and you forget them all, right? So this is going to be a very traditional seated test. They'll give you a location, they'll give you a time, it's not negotiable, you'll show up, You'll sit for the test. There's going to be someone doing construction next door to really throw a wrench in the plans, which is what happened to me once. Um, and, and it'll keep you on your toes. Uh, so the, these tests usually take about two to three hours. Um, you have to really block your schedule for them. And you'll be given you know, maybe a month's notice when you get to this point. Um, they're administered in person. They are usually multiple choice. And so the multiple choice test prep guide that I just mentioned it's linked there. It's good just to practice, especially if you have been out of multiple choice land for a while. I highly recommend reviewing that. Um, and again, we just saw the selection procedures um, part of the job announcement highlighted. That's a great place to prep for the written exam, right? The, the selection procedures will tell you the areas or topics that will be covered in the exam that you can prepare for. Or you can just 
read that the night before your exam to try to calm your nerves, right? If, if, you, don't, if you don't think you're going to prepare, that's okay too. There's also a type of exam called a supplemental questionnaire, and this is becoming much more common. Um, because the city gets so many applications or applicants for their open positions, there's often a screen that, that is part of the initial application called a, an SQ, a supplemental questionnaire. And the supplemental questionnaire is an exam. Um, it is a way to verify that the things, the, the minimum qualifications are met. Um, so it might say, you know, you said you have experience in education, tell me how many years, and you click down. Um, it may have you fill in an essay, a brief essay about how you got those three years of experience, right? So you talk about the college you taught at, you talk about this, that, or the other, and I'll, I'll go into more detail here in a second. Um, the supplemental questionnaire may be in person. You may be asked to show up and fill in an essay or fill in this, you know, brief questionnaire, or it might just be part of the application process and you click through it and it doesn't even feel like an exam. But surprise, it's your exam. And how will you know if your exam is a supplemental questionnaire? Where do you look? Yeah, someone's listening in the back. All right, selection procedures will tell you what kind of exam. So it will say supplemental questionnaire, 100%, if that's your only test. Very frequently, in fact, more frequently than not these days, it'll say 50% weight supplemental questionnaire as an initial screener, and then it'll say 50% written exam or 50% practical skills exam. So always look at the supplemental, uh, excuse me, the selection procedures to know what type of exam you'll have. Um, the SQ, right? So there's there's some good information here. And all right, we got this. Um, this is important. Err on the side of detail when you're filling out a supplemental questionnaire. Um, so this is like that moment in high school when they're like, write everything you remember about this novel that you didn't read, right? Um, this is when you're gonna just fill it in, okay? Um, but it's about your work history, so you don't have to lie. It's a beautiful thing. Err on the side of more detail than less, right? You want to fill in all of the details. You don't want to use acronyms, and I'll show you an example of this in just a second. Um, these responses, your written responses, are evaluated by a panel that does not have access to your application. So all they're going off of is your supplemental questionnaire. They may not have access to the full, you know, multi-page, multi-hour application that you painstakingly prepared. Um, so if your exam is a supplemental questionnaire, just really over, overdo it. TMI, too much information. That's what we want. And I'll give you an example here. Um, I use this in my other training too, so this might be familiar to some of you. When you're filling out the supplemental questionnaire, you want to avoid acronyms, you want to avoid being vague, you want to be just like overly descriptive. Um, like you're describing what you did for a living to someone who has never had a job before, right? You want to tell us every single thing. Don't assume that the panel knows what you're talking about, right? So you come and sit for a written exam. There's this group of people who, you know, days later are going to be reading what you wrote. It's on you to tell them how good you are and how qualified you are and why you're the best person for the job, right? Um, and you have to do that by talking about your work history. So we have this example very common supplemental questionnaire, maybe it's three or four questions, you know, how much experience do you have? How did you get the experience? You know, et cetera, anything else you'd like us to know. So this question, how did you gain your one or more years of experience was on a supplemental questionnaire for uh, a man working for DPH who I was working with. And he put this, we pulled up his application and he put this on his SQ. I worked at Edgewood. Does anybody know what Edgewood is? I see one and a half heads. Okay, tell me what Edgewood is. Yeah, exactly. Troubled youth, right? And it's like rehabilitative, and it's for kids who are kind of in need of ex you know, extreme intervention. And how do you know what Edgewood is? How do you know? Because you know from working, right? Some of us worked in nonprofits. I know what Edgewood is because I worked in nonprofits. I worked in social services before this, right? But the panel may not know what Edgewood is. Or they may have heard of it, but they can't place it. And they're not going to pull out their phone because they're lazy and they're not going to Google it, right? So do the Googling for them, all right? When you fill out your supplemental questionnaire, it's on you to say, I worked at Edgewood. And you really want to just squeeze out every detail that would be relevant, that would make you stand out for this position. He was applying to a Health Worker 3 role as a Health Worker 2. Um, and because he said, I worked at Edgewood, period, 
I did not know that this person had worked there for seven years. I did not know that he worked directly with youth, which is really hard work. I also didn't know that he became a manager during those seven years, which is also really hard work and amazing to have on a resume. Um, and he also was using the language that showed up in the job description, right? So the folks who work at Edgewood may not call their clients underserved youth, right? They may not call them whatever the job description is calling the position they're hiring for, but it's on you to kind of be savvy and have read the job description the night before and crammed for the exam so that you're able to speak the language of the panel, speak the language of the position you're applying to, to really make it clear that like, man, I've got this. I've got the experience. I've done it. I did seven years of it. I'm the best person. Yeah. If it's online, there's a character limit, and I think they tell you it's like 2,000 or 25, and so just like take out all the commas, yeah. take out all the space, like do cram it full, right? If it's written, obviously it would be the limit of the physical paper, right? Um, but thank you for asking. Really cram it full of all of the information that you can that shows this mystery panel of people who do not know you why you're the best person, right? This is your opportunity to brag, uh, which for most of us is really difficult uh, to do. But when you sit for an SQ, that is your test, and it's on you to really, really showcase what you've done. Um, another type of exam, so we've seen two types, right? We saw a written exam, which is your, your typical multiple choice. We've seen the supplemental questionnaire that's either an essay in person or an essay online. Um, and then there's an oral exam. It's usually in person, again, rated by a panel. We love panels in the city. Uh, it's a set of predetermined questions, which means that you will get the same set of questions that everyone else gets. Um, has anyone in here, some of you have been through the interview process with the city and county? Um, yes, and there are panels. We are not joking. There's like a bunch of people with no expressions and no emotions and no blood <laughs> running through their veins staring at you, right? And they read you the set of questions that everybody gets to be read, and then you can't deviate. And if you make a joke, forget it. All right, I'll tell you a funny story about trying to make a joke at a panel interview once. Um, so take your time to gather your thoughts before responding. Duh. However, when you're nervous, this is really hard to do, right? When there's five people staring at you and that you're not sure if they're, if they're people or not. Um, so and I, now I'm on a panel. So now I'm the person who gets to, to throw it back. Um, but really take time, right? It's, it's, um, it's very nerve wracking. It's a very unnatural way to exam, examine someone. Feels like an interview, but it's not. It's actually a test, right? But you are seated, you are responding, and it's really on you to like take that breath and make the most of your, your seat time because that really is your test. That's how you're being evaluated. Um, obviously, dress appropriately. Dress for the job you want. Um, and another tip, um, use the same strategy that you would on the supplemental questionnaire. Instead of writing out all the details of everything you've done and how great you are, you're going to talk about it, right? Um, so avoid acronyms. Avoid, you know, I did some of this stuff and some of that stuff for a while, right? I want to know how many years you did it. I want to know who you managed. I want to know how many people you managed. So it's really um, making that opportunity really, really clear to the panel that you've got the experience and more. You've done this and more. You've done that and more, right? So similar strategy, too much information. Bombard them with your fabulousness. Yes. Star. That's a good. That's a good point. Um, I. I don't think. I don't think we're that savvy, but I think it's a great approach if that's a way that helps you think. Um, situation, task, achievement, or action, result. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that in. I will make a note to myself and I'll send a little handout with the star, um, the star talking points on it. I can read my own writing at the end of the night. Thank you for bringing that up. I don't think that's necessarily what they're looking for. More than anything, they're looking for how you respond, if you've got the experience, if you can speak the lingo of the position they're hiring for. And pro tip, if you look at the job description, that's the lingo they're looking for. Yeah, go ahead. It's not usually HR. So again, every division and every department is different. But typically, a hiring panel will be the hiring manager, the person who's going to be your boss, um, and then a variety of folks that they've brought in for that panel. So maybe it'll be someone who's an expert in your field. Maybe it'll be someone who's just walking down the hall and they needed somebody because someone called them sick, right? There's usually at least one of those on every panel. you got to find their eyes, right? Because they're the ones who are just as scared as you are. Um, like, what am I doing here? 
Um, but typically the panel is diverse, intentionally diverse, so a, a mix of genders and races and, and experience in the city. Um, and then it's usually kind of a combination of a manager, another team member, and maybe a couple people who would be adjacent to your role. So at my panel for my current job, I'm in HR, but I'm a trainer. So I had a person who was a trainer on my panel. I had my hiring manager who was a social worker trainer person. And then the three other people were just like HR folks um, who I end up working sort of close to. Does that answer your question? And obviously every panel is different, but in general they try to put folks who are going to be, you know, useful additions to your interview, excuse me, to your um, exam, exam panel. Um, another type of exam is a training and experience exam. So this would be for more of the vocation type jobs that the city hires for, gardener, bus driver, some of those techni technical jobs. Um, it may be online as part of the application process. So again, you might not know you're taking a test, but you're taking a test. It'll say, tell me about how you learned how to fix buses, right? Um, and you'll have to answer those questions online when you submit your application. Um, do you remember the other type of test that sometimes is sneaky like that? The supplemental questionnaire sometimes looks like that. It, you won't know you're taking a test until you submit it, and you're like, oh, I should have I put a little more thought into that, right? Um, the training and experience evaluation is used to confirm previous work experience. Um, so if a specific job says, we need you to have 13 years of human resource analyst work, right? They may throw in this exam when you submit your application just to make sure you're not lying, right? To make sure that you can verify that you've actually had that experience because they're looking for a very specific type of candidate, right? Um, how many people have seen a job out in the wild posted on a job site and you don't quite meet all the qualifications, but you're like, I could figure this out. I'm really charming. Who's done that? Yes, perfect. That's the normal way that most normal people get normal jobs, right? We are not normal in the government, so uh, it doesn't matter if you're charming. It doesn't matter if you can figure it out on the job, which is actually kind of a bummer because that's how, again, most jobs happen. Um, usually you don't walk into a job having every single skill that they're looking for, but this is what we expect when you come to work in civil service. And then we teach you on the job anyway. <laughs> So as confusing as that is and as counterintuitive as that is, that's kind of the reality of civil service. Um, it's a merit-based system, right? So because of rules, regulations, state, federal, county, city guidelines, we have to hire in a very specific way and we have to exam people in a very specific way. And the best way that we've done that, which could always use some improvement, but what we've got for now is um, making sure that people have the experience and the qualifications before they come in. Um, and for some people, that's a really big problem because you can't learn on the job. You have to have everything before you come in. Um, but I have some strategies and workarounds for that if you come to my February 13th training. Another plug. Um, so again, similar to the other trainings, um, read the questions carefully, take your time, um, selecting the best option that matches your background. And again, an example of this might be a drop-down menu as you submit your application that says, do you have five years, 10 years, or 15 years of the required experience? Click carefully, right? Because you'll be judged on that. And another fun tip, when you take one of these online, even if you click the wrong thing and you're stressed out and you're in a hurry, you can't go back and fix it. You can't go back and fix your application and you can't go back and fix your exam. So really take your time and be careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can save it, but if you hit submit, you can't go back. But yes, there's an option to, there's a save option. Yeah, and when you go into, um, I would actually just, again, for homework for the newbies, if you find a job that you're even remotely interested in, click on it, click apply, and it'll open up this, um, essentially like a Word document format where you can save and, 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 and wait to submit and play with it. And um, so you don't have to submit it when you open it, but once you click submit, it's, it's over. Um, you know, a ton of classic examples of this are like the person who submitted their application at 501 or they submitted their, you know, test a minute, literally a minute late, and then they go and petition to HR and HR says like, sorry, we're, we operate on fairness, we, you know, you didn't, you didn't make the cutoff, right? So 
you know, it, it's sort of counter human. It's sort of counter natural. It's sort of counter intuitive the way that we hire, but it's because we have all of these rules and regulations we're beholden to as part of civil service commission, city, county, state, et cetera, um, guidelines when we hire for government work. Um, so really take this, take this process seriously. Um, only have an adult beverage in your hand when you're looking for jobs, not when you're filling out your exam. Pro tip. Another type of exam is a performance exam. And again, this one's going to be in person. Another panel. We love panels. Um, and this type of exam is designed to mimic real life tasks and situations on the job. Um, so you may have to like dismantle some sort of machine if you're getting a machinist job in the city. Or you might have to go out in the field um, and do some sort of uh, work uh, as an arborist if we're hiring you as a tree specialist, right? This is much more rare. A lot of our jobs are administrative jobs. Um, but this also is a component, and it will tell you in, this, in the um, selection procedures whether or not that's going to be part of your test. Um, and again, show all the steps or parts of the task presented to you is kind of the pro tip on that type of exam. Um, don't rush through it. You want to be deliberate, just as you would write out a beautiful essay about how fabulous you are. You would also want to dismantle the thing or build the thing or do the thing in a really deliberate way so that you can show the panel what it is that you're doing in that moment. Questions about this type of exam? This is like sort of thinking like a classic Muni driver test. It would be like, OK, move this giant bus around the corner and back it up, right? That would be kind of a, a, a classic performance exam. Um, the management and supervisory test battery is another type of exam, and it's online. Um, you have to go and sit at a computer, and it's allegedly very difficult. I haven't taken it. Um, you're given information about a fictitious organization and asked to assume the role of the manager. And then you're given a bunch of questions, essentially a bunch of situations that you have to manage your way through. Um, most questions have more than one right answer, uh, and you get partial points for partially correct answers. So an example of this might be, you know, um, you notice that one of your employees is taking home city property, and he's done it the last couple of weeks. You haven't said something, and now you need to clarify what's going on, right? How would you approach it? They'll give you four options, and maybe two of those are decent. Um, and if you answer, if you pick one or two of the two decent answers, you would get partial points for that. Um, similar to your application and similar to other aspects of city work, you cannot go back and change your answers because it's all on the computer. Um, and you also have to monitor your time thinking about like a high stakes online uh, or computer based test. You, you can't go back and you have to finish within an, an allotted window. Multiple question and there's also essay. There's essay component. Mm -hmm, exactly. It's a written test. And I haven't taken it, um, but I also one time asked a coworker who had just taken it, um, and he was like, I cannot disclose anything that was on that test. It's against the rules. I signed an oath, and I, I felt really bad because mostly I was just asking, like, was it stressful? But he felt like I was trying to, like, pry for the answers. Um, and he was a great civil servant. He didn't budge. So good for him. Um, but allegedly, because I have not taken this test, um, it is, it is a mixture of, of a multiple choice and written, and again, sort of situational um, questions rather than like memorizable facts. It's more of the nuance of like, how would you navigate this interpersonal conflict? How would you navigate this like tricky situation? Um, who would you report this thing to first if it happened while you were on shift, et cetera? Um, Computer-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I do. I think they're ambiguous intentionally, and I think even the right, like, even if that was happening to me right now in my job now, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> 
So like I would I would probably go to my supervisor because I work in a very hierarchical organization, et cetera, et cetera. But I think your point is really is really adept. It's like obviously once you're on the job, you would have to learn what it is that they prefer you do, et cetera, et cetera. But I think more than anything, they're just trying to see like if you have management experience, you might answer it a certain way. If you don't have management experience, you might answer another way. If you are more ego driven as a manager, you might answer it impulsively versus doing something that would be more of like a collaborative solution. But again, I can't speak to the test and they're also different every time they have them. They they rewrite them every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, 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 and honestly, at the end of the day, civil service exams are written by people, um, and people are inherently people and have flaws and have biases and have preferences. And so um, as a former educator and as a current trainer, um, I have to say that you know, the, exams, the exams are gatekeeping, but they're also not perfect instruments, right? We are also losing a ton of really great people every time we have an exam that isn't dialed in. Um, or that is written in a way that is biased or, 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 or slanted, and they're written by people, right? Um, so that's just kind of a general disclaimer. Um, I'm actually not a huge fan of standardized tests, even though I administered many in my, in my higher ed world. Um, and yet, it's part of the civil service structure. Um, and until that structure changes, this is kind of what we have to navigate if you want to work in civil service. So it's, it's kind of a bummer. Like, it's not a great tool. It's a, it's a poorly... Uh, poorly uh, refined instrument at the moment, and it's kind of all we have to figure out how we let in, you know, of hundreds of applicants, how we whittle that down to 75, um, and then who we interview from there. And of course, there's going to be flaw, and of course, there's going to be error, and of course, there's going to be bias, because humans wrote the test. Um, so that's just kind of a general, like, bummer, um, like, fact about education and standardized testing in general. Um, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't show up and try your best, and you may test three times and on the third time, you test really well, right? Um, so a lot of it is just kind of managing yourself, and we're going to go into that in just a second. Um, so those are the exam types, right? Written, oral, uh, the performance exam, the training and experience exam, the supplemental questionnaire, which isn't really an exam. Um, and then the last one was the manager-supervisor battery. You will know what kind of test you will be expected to take when you scroll all the way to the bottom of your job that you're looking at. It'll tell you what type of test to expect, even if it's a year later, that they tell you to show up, right? Um, so there are ways you can prepare, um, acknowledging that these tests are all super keyed in to the person writing them, and they're different every time. There are ways you can prepare um, by looking at the position description, right? What are we calling our clients these days? Are we calling them underserved? Are we calling them at risk, right? Um, get the lingo down, because you may uh, use that in a written test. You may also use that in an oral test. Again, the selection procedures will tell you, oh, they're looking for someone with interpersonal conflict experience. I'm going to watch a YouTube video, right? Um, and seriously, Google and YouTube, right? Uh, I wish this would have been around when I was new in the workforce, because I probably would have come off way better in interviews. There's a ton of civil service exam um, tests and, and tips and ways to practice. There's videos. Um, you know, civil service means city, county, state, federal employment. So there's a lot of different examples. And more than um, cracking the code on how to pass the test, these are really about reducing your anxiety. Like, people take tests all the time. If I don't pass, I can just take it again, right? It's really a way for you to feel, if you're the kind of person that likes to prepare, do this. Go on YouTube, go on Google. There's a lot of great resources. Make them your best friends forever, right? It seems silly, it seems obvious, but it's real. It's good, yes. Exactly. Yeah, we have a bunch of library resources coming up in a future slide. Um, on the day of the exam, you've done some prep work, and there's more resources I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to in just a second that are here at the library um, and online. But the day of the exam, right, most importantly, more importantly than reading the job description, more importantly than obsessing over the, the terminology they're using these days for your work, um, and more important than the critical YouTube video that I recommended you look at, is really to be gentle with yourself because more than anything, the performance on an exam is about anxiety. The way you perform on exam, the way your brain works, the way you show up, the way you hold a pencil, it's all about how you manage your stress for that like two hour window. Um, and that's bad news if you're anxious like me. But if you can figure out a way to like get through it, maybe you don't have coffee till after the test or whatever you need to do, right? 
um, do whatever you can to be gentle with yourself and be calm and, and to put yourself in your best mode to do well. Um, test taking is a muscle. And a lot of us haven't flexed it in a while, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel weird. It's going to feel hard. It's going to feel sore, right? But really be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with your own mind. Be gentle with your own sort of experience of the exam. And you'll do much better um, than you would if you just let your, your heebie-jeebies run wild. Yes. Um, so, we're talking about computers. Mm -hmm. So, No, that's a great question, and yeah, um, that's a great question, and I would say no. Um, usually the written exam is something you sit for, and you can actually wear sweatpants to that, because the proctor doesn't care what you're wearing, right? But yeah, <laughs> she was comfortable, right? So again, it depends on the type of exam. There were a couple of exams that are in person, right, in front of a panel. Those are the ones you're going to want to wear fancy clothes to, but if you're super stressed out about test taking, you can wear whatever you want to wear as long as it's street legal, okay? Um, and take care of yourself, right? Wear what, what feels comfortable. Eat and drink and, and be, be ready for that, that sort of high pressure thing. Um, to pretend it's not high pressure won't help, but to really prepare yourself and say, okay, I need more coffee this day. I need less coffee this day. I need some protein. I need some whatever, right? You don't get to use a calculator if there's math. Um, and if there is math, you won't know till you get there. Um, I sat for an exam for a trainer position and there was math. And I was doing long division and I was sweating and there was jackhammering. It was, it was a bad situation. Um, so if there's math, it'll be a surprise to you and me on your test. Um, but they give you, yes, if, there's, if, there's like, if it's like an accounting clerk job, they might provide you with the tools. If it's an online sort of computer-based test, there might be some sort of tool, but all of that will be explain to you when you show up. Um, if it's like a super like math position, like accounting, there's more than likely going to be all the tools you need, um, maybe an Excel spreadsheet, et cetera. But most of the written exams, um, you don't know what's going to be on it. And I took a written exam once for, I can't remember what position, and there was a photo of an Excel spreadsheet cell. And it was like, what, what function would you use to do? I was just like, oh my God, I can't do this on a computer, let alone like handwritten, right? So it's, it's whatever they've decided as the test writers to put in the test. Um, but again, the selection procedures will tell you if it's going to be heavily math or calculator based or whatever. And then they'll give you all of the procedures when you arrive in your fluffy pink slippers. Um, and again, just thinking kind of about the exam, it's, it is high stakes and these are coveted jobs and it's stressful and you really want it. And also, these, we give these about every year. So if you don't pass it this time or you don't do well this time, acknowledge that it probably would have taken a couple of years for you to get hired anyway. And consider it a blessing. You got a sneak peek at how to pass the test. Um, and you, you, got, you got to kind of deal with the nerves of that the first time so that the next time you show up, you're like, I got this. I'll wear something more comfortable and I'll drink less coffee or whatever you need to do um, on the day of. Um, there's a little bit of interview prep, and then there's some more resources. We're almost done. Um, yes. I have a question about the test. Do mm -hmm. you just go to your own interview process? You do. And then what is the typical interview process? Wow. Good depends on the test, and it depends on the position, right? Um, and, and I'll talk much more about this at my February 13th um, chat, so I'll do a very quick overview right now. Once you pass the application, and then you get invited to take your test, and then you take your test, Months later, they will send you an email that says, you know, congratulations, you scored 973 out of a total of 1130. And none of that will make sense to you. And then they'll tell you another number, like you ranked 17, which will also not make sense to you. And then you'll call someone you know who works for Alameda County, and you'll have them help you understand. Because um, you're like, what? Or you'll email me, and I'll be like, it's OK, you did great. This is what that means. But they won't tell you you did great. They'll just give you a bunch of numbers, OK? Um, Again, if you go back to the job description, it will tell you what that number means. The email will also attempt to tell you what that number means, but it'll be really confusing. Um, and basically, your rank is what dictates your, um, your proximity to being called for an interview. Um, a, a very quick example is, let's say that my job, my trainer job, has a rule of three. That means that the first people given preference for an interview are the people who rank in the top three, right? But 
our rank is determined by our score. So there might be more than three people who ranked in the top three. Because if I tied for first with a bunch of other amazing overachievers like me, there may be five of us who are ranked one. If you're a clerk and we hire hundreds of clerks a year, you might be tied with like 75 people who ranked one. Okay? So the rule is what tells you about where you'll be batched, but it doesn't tell you that you're like the third person on the list, right? The lists are posted publicly on the SFDHR website, so you can look at them once they're posted and see exactly where you fall. Um, but rank sometimes means you're the only one and you're number three and it's great, and rank sometimes means you're one of 17 people who ranked third. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will go into it. I'm actually going to, in the interest of time, I'll take that after class. Class. Um, and I'm also going to talk about it more on the 13th if you want to come to that talk. Okay. That's okay. I'll talk to you after this. Yeah. Because um, that's a little bit more specific after the exam. Um, but I can talk about that after for anyone who wants to stay. And I'll pull up an, an example of it. Um, quick more panel discussion. I pulled this from the, the show Pose, which I love. Um, almost everyone gets a 10. Um, my type of panel. Uh, just a quick note on interviews, because everything you'll do for test prep can also be useful for interview prep, right? Um, the same, you might look, recognize this slide. I basically copied everything and just changed out this word interview instead of yeah. test prep. Because if you look at the job description, if you look at the selection procedures, what kind of person are they looking to hire, right? What kind of skills are they looking for? And again, our friend Google still helps. There's a ton of amazing interview prep questions that you can just Google. Um, I do career coaching as part of my job at DPH, and I was working with a woman who was a high-level exec who was going for even higher-level executive position, and I was like, how am I going to help her? I don't, I'm not this heavy of a hitter. And we got on Google, and she found a bunch of practice questions, and she got the job, and it's a beautiful thing, right? So it's not about me. It's about Google. Go there, okay? They will help you. Um, and again, review the position description before your interview when you get called after your exam. All of the like nuggets and all of the keywords that they're going to be listening for are going to be in the job description. Um, so do that before you prep for the interview. Um, behind the scenes, the stuff they don't want you to know, right? These are typical interview questions. There's no guarantee every interview panel is different and every question is different, but in general, you can bank on a question about why you would be best for the job, right? There's usually a question about managing conflict, right? Tell me about a time you had to deal with a difficult client. Tell me about a time you had to deal with a difficult coworker. I'm talking really fast. I'm sorry, because I want to make sure you, I'm respecting your time. There's usually a question about working with diverse patients or diverse colleagues. Um, I'm kind of over the word diverse, but you know what they're getting at. How do you handle like intercultural, interracial, et cetera, um, communication? And again, the position description will kind of nudge you in the direction of what you can prep for. Um, the gentleman who had worked at Edgewood, who was going from Health Worker 2 to Health Worker 3, um, he would have had a lot to say about this question because of the populations that he worked with at Edgewood. And he would sizzle in that interview if he used exactly the language and the terminology that the, that the city is using to describe the target population rather than the, what he called his clients or his patients or his residents, right? So again, use the language of the position description because you're, you're translating your fabulous work history into government jargon and making it really easy and palatable for them to see how fabulous you are. Um, and again, same thing with the interview, same thing with the test, being gentle with yourself, how you monitor your own anxiety and your stress is really what's gonna help you talk about yourself well um, and so do what you need to do. Don't forget to brag. Um, and just a quick tip, it's, it's easy to forget this, um, but in the civil service, by the time you've applied and taken an exam, you are so vetted. They have vetted you, they've put you through the sieve, they've made sure that you're like one of the top whatever candidates, right? So you deserve to be there, right? I think it's very easy when you sit in an interview and there's people staring at you that you feel like, ooh, God, I'm not good enough, right? Well, HR thought you were good enough, okay? And then the test people thought you were good enough. So these people, this is just the icing on the cake, right? Um, so really sit, situate yourself in that. You got through the worst of it, and now you're interviewing. Great. And again, you get to practice. If the interview doesn't go the way you wanted it to go, you got to practice, and you get to meet folks who you might work with in the future. Um, a quick note on testing accommodations. Some people don't have to take an exam. Okay, we have a process where you can, um, if you have a qualifying disability, you can reach out to the person listed at the top of your job announcement 
and explain, I have this thing, right? And you don't need to tell me what it is, but you can talk with them. They can make an accommodation, either give you more time, or if you are qualified, you can do the ACE program, the Access to City Employment Program. If you have a qualifying disability under their rules, you don't have to take the test at all. Okay, it's a way to try to get everybody from a diverse um, sort of cognitive and physical background into city employment if taking the exam would be prohibitive. So some tools for folks who may need it, highly recommend taking advantage. Um, and again, these websites, which I'll pull up after for those of you who want to stick around. More resources. The library does have a ton of great resources. Um, there's practice test banks. There's e-learning modules on the library website. And again, if you have your library card, you can access that. There's also multiple choice test prep. Um, again, login required. And YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. There's so many good videos. Just general multiple choice skills stuff. Um, I was watching one the other day when I was prepping for this. And it was this woman with like the most soothing voice. And she was like, if there's a, if there's a selection of four, usually two out of four are going to be pretty close. If you can eliminate two, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about I forgot about that, right? Like I haven't taken a test in a while. Um, so if you're an anxious person, if you are nervous about the test, do all of those things if it helps you reduce your anxiety because it's really the anxiety that's going to be the hard thing of the test. It's not really the test itself. Yeah. Select Learning Express when you go here. Um, and again, I'll send you these slides. And then you can search. If you do civil service, there will be a number of tests that will pop up that are, that are just civil service exams. Thank you for asking. Yeah, this, this connects to this. And then there's practice test banks as well. And there's also some books. If you're like an old school book person, there's some civil service books if that helps you quell your fears. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Ooh. Okay. Testimonial, right here. And frankly, probably an HR person came and got that book right after you, and they pulled some questions because they were like, I don't know how to write a test, right? Real talk. So that's cool, right? If you practice, there might be some similarity with what you find online. And again, I'll send these slides out if you want to just follow the links. Um, questions before we pull up websites? General questions? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, I feel like there's, an, on February 13th, the next time we hang out, um, I sort of use this parallel of like, there's the real world where you send like a thank you email and everyone loves you and then you get the job. And in, in the fake world, government hiring, we, we can't accept any of that because it looks like bribery. It looks like nepotism. It's like, it's like against the rules. Um, so I think intentionally we don't share the information of who's on the panel um, you may end up working with them in the future. You can thank them. One of my besties at my job now was on my hiring panel. Um, and so I got to thank him after the fact. Um, but yeah, it's 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 counterintuitive. You don't get to do all the nice things you would normally do at a normal job interview for a normal job because we're not normal. Yes. And then I'll tell you. Uh-huh. It depends on the position. Um, it depends on the level of position. I think for executives, there's like multi layers of interviews. Um, depending on how fast they need to hire someone, they may just do like a three person panel. It really depends on the job. Um, there's always going to be one interview, and then there may be more, which you'll be notified of. Um, I recently sat on a panel, and there were two really good candidates, and we liked them both. And so we brought them both back individually with a smaller group to do kind of a second round. And then that helped us make our decision. But you'll be notified. And there's a lot of like emailing and a lot of like disclosures because it's government. So you'll be well informed if there's next steps to your interview. Um, that's the good news and the bad news of applying to government work is you'll be extra informed about every step of the process. Um, yes. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think you can. I think you can, but I also don't know. Um, usually they give you like all the questions on a piece of paper so you don't have to. I think they really want you to like be engaged. Right. Right. You can't leave with it. Right. It's like literally taped to the table. 
for an, an extra layer of intimidation and inhumanity. Um, but yeah, like all the questions, like they'll read them to you, even though you're reading them and looking at them at the same time. It's it's part of the it's part of the process. Um, so I think you can like take notes if you have your own notepad, but it doesn't really help or hurt because you'll have everything in front of you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Any other questions? And then I'll answer your question about the tests. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, actually, I'll answer that because that's what I do for a living. Um, I am a trainer, so I run you know professional development trainings. I do a lot of anti-racist work with physicians, nurses, and, and other providers. But I also do career advancement workshops, and I work with people one-on-one -on -one who have been in the same job for 10 years and they're fed up and they want something different. That was literally today. Um, so there are resources within your department for advancement. For a lot of people, getting that permanent job is the most important first step and then you pass your probation and then you're permanent and from there you can move on sort of safely with the protections of your union and the protections of your role to explore other jobs. Um, and some people don't want to move. Some people just want to be a clerk and they want to retire as a clerk and that's totally fine. But there are ways to move up, and it's the same process once you're in. And I think it was you who mentioned um, you may have a temp job or you may have some job that you really, really like, and seven years into it you want a challenge. You're going to have to show up and apply and sit for the test just like everybody else, even though you know everyone who's going to interview you and even though you know the department and you've lived in the city and all that stuff. Um, even once you're inside, you still have to be on the, the list. You have to have taken the test if it's a permanent role. There are some exceptions to that, which are, I'm sorry, on happening on February 13th, but I can also talk with you a little bit more about that. Um, there are temporary roles you can take once you're permanent. Um, so for example, I somehow, by some miracle, passed my probation, and I am now a permanent civil servant, which means that if I want to like dabble in some other field, and I'm qualified, and I pass the exam and all that stuff, I can jump to that job internally, but I would need to compete with everyone else from the outside. If there's a temporary job that's open, remember temporary means no exam. If there's a temp job that I'm like, I could probably do that and I could pass the minimum qualifications, I can jump to that temp job, but I can keep my permanent job, which means that when the temporary job runs out, I can go back, revert back to my permanent civil service role, which is again, one of the benefits of being permanent. Um, it's not a benefit if you're temp because I'm both holding my other position that no one else can take while I'm dabbling with the temp role, and then if I go back, another temp would have to fill my job. Um, so it's, it's good for me once you're in, but it's not great if you're trying to navigate the temp system, and I would be more than happy to talk more about that because I know a lot of the details, but that's kind of a high-level answer to your question, I think. Any other general questions before we pull up website? Yes. Excellent question. Um, I can only speak for DPH because that's where I'm really embedded, but I know citywide the mayor has um, worked with the unions very closely because there was kind of a glut of hiring temps because it takes so long to hire permanent folks. Um, again, on the 13th I'll go into more depth, but it took me about a year to get my job, like a calendar year. Um, not everybody can wait that long, right? And so it becomes an equity issue, it becomes all sorts of layers of issues, and because it takes so long to hire someone permanently, uh, the city ended up hiring a bunch of temps because it's faster, they don't have to do the test, they can bring them in and, and, and bring them out. And that created another equity issue because if we're only hiring temp people, then there are people who are not getting the benefits, not getting the protections of the union, not getting all of these other things while doing the work of a government employee. So right now, the current trend is to try to reverse that tide a little bit. The mayor has made it a directive and HR, both citywide and all the, the different HRs within the different units of the city, are actively trying to intentionally hire more permanent. So that's good news for you if you want a new job in the next three years, but no sooner. I'm, I'm joking, but it's tragic. Um, but think about it. It's a long-term long strategy. It's a slow burn. Um, a lot of people wait multiple years to get the job they really, really want because of how long it takes and because of the testing and because of the scoring and because of the ranking. So. Um, when I said you were new and I would send you running out the door, whoever was brand new to this, yes, um, that's why. It's a, it's not a quick job. It's a, it's a slow burn. It's something that you're like, okay, this is what I want to do in two or three years, so I'm going to start the process now. Um, temp jobs are faster, but they're temp. 
permanent jobs are slower to hire, but they're permanent. And of course, all of the good things that come from that, including a career and a pension and stability and union representation. Um, and then, of course, it's it's the waiting, right? And more than happy to talk about that. Uh, it depends on the type of temp job, um, and it'll usually say in the fine print uh, when you apply to a temp job, like, this is a Category 18, which can last up to three years, or this is a Category 16, which can last up to a year. Um, what that really means, though, is it depends once you show up. Um, so I actually started as a temp, and I didn't know, because I didn't know. I was like, oh, I didn't have to take a test. This is great. Like, awesome. Um, but what it meant was that I was, like, essentially filling in for someone who had had a baby, right? So I like quit my I quit my day job. I like started my city job. I bought like a velvet suit. I was feeling like so good for myself. And about 90 days into my what I didn't know was a temp job, temp job, um, this woman came to my office and she was like, "Oh, it's, I've heard so much about you. Like, thanks for filling in." And it was the woman who had had a baby, and it had taken so long to hire me that her baby was like, you know, graduating from high school, <laughs> and I, and 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 I my job was up. Right, and, and so I was like panicked and there was a couple weeks where they were like, we can try to keep you on, but we actually can't. And because of some dumb luck, I had also taken an exam for the trainer position, but I had applied to both and it was really confusing. I was like, I thought I would apply to this and then I uh, didn't have to take a test, now I have to take a test. So by some miracle, I happened to like be on the list for the permanent job that was also opening. And so I was able to like jump to that without an interruption in my, in my work. But it was like dumb luck, and I don't recommend anyone doing that. Um, but some of the temp jobs are like very, very temp. Um, it's it's rare that that happens, but because hiring takes so long, it sometimes does. Um, I was working with a nurse practitioner who essentially had a very similar thing happen. She's like, I got hired in December, and like right now she's being told that the person who like broke their hip is coming back and is rehabilitated, and it's amazing. And so she's like, well, I, I guess I'll go back to Kaiser, right? Um, and luckily for her, she has a high earning job and she's able to jump around, but it's it's um, a little precarious when you're looking at temp jobs, so so definitely read the fine print and, and ask people to help you understand that. Yes? Yeah, TPD, mm -hmm. that's one of the acronyms, the temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TPV. Yeah, temp te temporary provisional is TPV. It's yeah. it's less common than the other temporary ways we hire, but it's again, it's a workaround because it takes a long time to hire, or because of the civil service rules, there isn't a sitting list. So TPV less common, but it, it happens. Um, I know a woman at PUC. All these acronyms. Public Utilities Commission. She started as TPV temporary provisional, um, and you know they said you know we'll let you know when we're going to actually have a test ready for this job, but you might lose your job if you don't test yeah. well and if you don't enter <laughs> right. And so she was like, okay, I'll try it. Um, but that's that's that acronym TPV. It's temporary, but it's like a little nuance of temporary, which means that you know it doesn't matter how good you are if you don't pass the test, they can't bring you right back into the job you were doing before. So it's a little bit different than other temp jobs, but it is a way to get in. Um, so don't shy away from temp work. Just know that it'll be a little bit of a workaround um, rather than like a straightforward like apply test. They love you. Happy 30th anniversary, um, which is what we all hope for. Uh, other questions before I pull up the websites? And I'll probably take this off because of the sound. No? Thank you. Your stamina is incredible. Uh, I appreciate your attention. And I will send a follow-up email to everyone who put their info on the sign-in sheet. There's also evaluations. So I'm going to keep yammering and show people websites. But please fill those out if you don't want to listen anymore. You don't have to. Thank you for being here. And I hope to see you on the 13th.